Oh, 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 o
appreciate how they're taking life for granted, which is a super fun concept. We find out that the Jigsaw Killer is this like demented fucking guy who's prying on these people and the negative attributes of their life. A very fun killer concept for a movie. And also we get kinda old Danny Glover. Completely forgot he was in this movie. This is my best Danny Glover. And don't put blackface on me. I can't believe that happened. Is that pretty good? <laughs> it feels pretty good. Where's the jigsaw killer at? I want to. I want to get a hold of him. <laughs> Please don't put blackface on me. <laughs> But essentially the movie shows our two characters, Dr. Lawrence Gordon and Adam. Forgot his last name, doesn't matter. But they're both chained to pipes the whole time. We have the infamous body in the middle of the room with a gun, he killed himself. And now it accumulates to them trying to figure out why are they in this room until the story unravels all of their dirty laundry, all of the skeletons in their closet, revealing that Dr. Lawrence Gordon might be cheating on his wife. He might be getting a little hospital pussy. I'm pretty sure the girl he's fucking is one of the doctors, which honestly I must say, not too bad, Dr. Gordon. Going, not too bad. Just kidding. His wife has huge tits. Don't put that in. And Adam is, I guess, a private detective, but just a photographer. He takes pictures of people. He tails them. That's probably on private investigation. It doesn't fucking matter. He has pictures of Dr. Gordon, and it's this big whole triangle back and forth. But we find out that actually Dr. Gordon's family is being held hostage and that they're going to get killed at gunpoint unless he's able to get out of the traps, which are there's some bone saws there, and we're led to believe that they're supposed to saw through their foot. Hence the movie Saw, right? Great name. For first movie, mm, so good. Little bone saw, little of this, little of that. Love it. The first movie is actually pretty tame in terms of like how gruesome it is. And don't get me wrong, it does show a lot of violent stuff, but I think it does it in a very early 2000s tasteful way. And by that, I mean there's a lot of footage of things like speeding up and people being like, ah! I think it's taking hold of the really popular edit from Jacob's Ladder in the 90s, where the guy was like, whatever, and you know, kind of crazy stuff. A lot of white flashes, a lot of like camera spinning, a lot of crazy like internal, like people like screaming. It just screams early 2000s. And honestly, when watching the first movie, I kind of loved it. Everything is so gritty and dark and gross. I mean, like every apartment, everybody's like living in industrial, gross, rusty apartments. And I don't know if that's James Wan trying to allude to like the sickest, the dirtiest of souls live here. And if the, the environment they're supposed to be in is kind of like some weird Silent Hill kind of like they're living in their own disgusting filth. It's not that the buildings are just disgusting, but it like, I mean, some of these sets, it's like you're a doctor and you live in this fucking like dilapidated rusty metal building. What the fuck? The traps for this film are the bathroom trap with the chains of the pipes, the saws, we already told you about that one. Razor wire maze, which is just about a guy who tried killing himself, apparently took life for granted, and now he has to crawl through a maze and cut himself a bunch, but the guy just ends up bleeding to death. And they do a really funny fast montage of him crawling around the maze. <laughs> it, it made me laugh pretty hard. The next one is the probably the most famous of the film, which is the reverse bear trap, which is like the thing is put in your mouth and it rips open. They use that one quite a bit. I think that becomes kind of a staple, you know, amongst the series. And then of course, the flammable jelly, which is a really fun one of a guy is caked in this like combustible jelly and he has to use a candle and decipher this code to get him out of the room, but then he burns to death. But they're all done. It's not like really relevant like later on in the series, a lot of these deaths, it's like really trying to show all the crazy shit. This one is all from the perspective of the detectives coming to the scenes afterwards. And it's kind of done in just like, uh, almost as if they're imagining it happening. I think it's pretty tasteful. Honestly, I think it's very well done. And then of course there's a guy who has power drills going into his neck. And that's when we see Jigsaw for the first time and you find out he's a sick old man. So pretty good. And you know, we have other classic things that sets up like the creepy, like, I wanna play a game. I wanna play a game. The puppet and that kind of thing, which it is kind of a cute puppet. He comes riding in and it's it's a lot of fun. I think his name's Billy. I don't know. Might be true. I'm not sure. All in all, the big twist of this movie is that at the end, Dr. Gordon does saw off his leg once he find, he thinks that his family is being killed. And uh, the guy who's been dead on the floor the whole time gets up. That's actually Jigsaw. And he takes off the makeup of a shot head because also apparently not only is he like an amazing engineer, but also he's an amazing practical effects artist. And he says, game over. And slides the door. And the guy's like, no, game over. Ah! And he shuts the door. And that, let, let me tell you something. The first movie, it works. The first movie works. Which if I had to, you know, if I had to place the movie now, since it's our first one, I put it up here. 
Nice number one. It deserves to be at the top. I mean, it's the thing that started the franchise. You know, is that gonna change later on? I don't know. You know, with each movie, we'll see. But you know, the movie is, I think it's shot on film. I don't think it's digital. It's very gritty. You see a lot of the texture of the film grain. It's very like yellow and green, which kind of becomes like the color of the movies. I don't know. It's just very odd. But all in all, fun twist. It's very, extremely heavily influenced by Seven. Rewatching it, I was like, this feels just like Seven. Which I gotta tell you, if you wanna watch this kind of film, just watch Seven. Just a better movie, honestly. Much better done. Much better acting. It doesn't matter. Tobin Bell did his best, but all in all, it's a fun. I mean, for the beginning of a horror franchise that's just about like weird smut torture stuff, pretty fun. Get the pig mask introduced. Good stuff. I remember when I was a kid, that scared the fuck out of me, that scene. That was like the biggest thing. He's taking pictures in an apartment because he's the photographer lighting up the space. <laughs> Big jump scare. Scared me a lot. Didn't like it. But, you know, number one. Number one for now. We'll see. Going on to Saw 2. Oh baby, Saw 2. Now Saw 2 is the big follow-up to this very commercially successful Saw it's just called Saw, it's not Saw 1, but at this point we'll call it Saw 1. Did we expect the sequel to do just as good? Well, guess what it did. They got a $4 million budget, uh, about like two or $3 million more, two or $3 million, million dollar? Jesus Christ. Two or $3 million dollar, dollars, dollars! Two or three million dollars more than the first movie, and this motherfucker made 147.7 million bones. Pretty crazy. This is when, now this is something where we're like, okay, these are easy to make, they're cheap to make, we're gonna start busting them out every year, which is why this movie came out in 2005. Give me that synopsis. A group of people, including a detective son, are trapped in a house filled with nerve gas and must navigate a series of deadly traps to escape. Meanwhile, the detective confronts Jigsaw in person. Which, let me start this off right now. This movie stars Donnie Wahlberg. And let me tell you something, he is not a leading man. I like Donnie, I think he's a good guy, but his charisma does not come through as a leading man. Better as a side character, to be completely honest. But he does try his heart out, and this time, the big thing is that, what does any franchise do when they try to do a sequel? You go bigger. You add more people into the mix, right? The first movie, it's just two guys in a fucking room, it's boring. Now it's like six or seven people in a house. Go big or go home. <laughs> right? The whole thing with this is they all wake up and, you know, Jigsaw does his blah, 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 blah. But this thing is kind of interesting is Amanda from the first movie, the girl that has the little bear trap, she's back at it. She's in this one now too. And you're like, ooh, what did that bitch do to get back here? But Jigsaw basically says that the house is being filled with a toxic gas and that the only way to get out is to find an antidote to escape the house, yada, yada, yada. And one of the people in the house is Donnie Wahlberg's son. So, you know, he has, I guess, motive to do that. And also we find out that Jigsaw has, he's dying. He has cancer. The movie starts and Jigsaw's there and he's just ready to give up. He's like, I'm dying. I have the big C. So take me, dude. And he says a little something like, What you have to do is sit here and talk to me. If you do that long enough, then you will find your son in a safe and secure state. And Donnie Wahlberg has to really swallow deep because he's wanting to kill this motherfucker because he sees his son on the screen. So let's list the traps off in this movie because there's a lot of traps. More people, more traps. Nerve gas house. Key behind the eye. Owie. Cops get their legs broken and electrocuted. <laughs> that was pretty funny. And actually, whenever that happens too, the tricycle comes out at the top of the stairs. And I thought that was actually very cute. <laughs> He's like, Pretty good. Which also, if you're going into a maniac's den who's known for like industrial grade torture devices, why would you just kind of like be like, oh, do, 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 do. walk in into a fucking steel cage? Whatever, dude. A cab. <laughs> I'm kidding. Gun through the eye hole. Homeless guy burns up in a furnace trying to grab some syringes. The pit of syringes, which is probably the best one in the movie. Hands in the box. You put your hands in a box, but you can't pull them out without shredding your skin. Those are the traps this time around. We start off, Donnie Wahlberg doesn't have a good relationship with his son, which sets it up perfectly that now he has to prove his love to his son. He has to go save him. That gives us all the motive in the world. So our A plot is watching people try to work together in this crazy house with all these interesting characters. Really the only notable character is Donnie Wahlberg's son, the weird thing about this movie is that they have to work together because they don't realize that they all have numbers tattooed at the back of their neck. And a lot of these group ones that we'll find are just kind of like the key is working together or not being selfish is kind of the big reveal here of the game, which essentially you have all these fun things. You know, like I said, you see Amanda get picked up by the angry Mexican guy and thrown into a syringe pit. That's always brutal and pretty funny just because that would suck. And especially funny because she gets out and he's unable to lock it in time, even though he has the key, but he can't find the lock and they run out of time. So it's all for 
nothing. Owie, owie, owie. The biggest reveal of all is that Amanda is actually helping Jigsaw, or she is the new Jigsaw in this one. And Donnie Wahlberg, he should have just not beaten the shit out of Jigsaw, and he should have just stayed put like he was told, because his son was actually in the safe the whole time. And all of the screens weren't live, they were pre-recorded, and his son was in a gun safe with uh, oxygen. <laughs> You do have a shot at the end and Jigsaw's like sitting there and he's like kind of smiling and he has like just his face is totally fucked from, from Donnie beating him up. Donnie! Why'd you do it, Donnie? I mean, all in all, actually, I was pretty underwhelmed with this. It's not like the worst thing in the world, but all of the contraptions, I don't think they were as fun. It didn't feel as moody or gritty as the first movie. They all just kind of felt like, oh, you're poisoned. So it's just kind of like, oh, syringe or people getting shot in the head, etc. I don't know. The syringe pit is the highlight of the movie. Everything else to me is just pretty forgettable. I mean, it introduces us to more of the police department introduces us more to jigsaw we get more face time with jigsaw he's not so mysterious in this one which tobin bell like i said he carries the movie just like the same way he carried seinfeld when he was on seinfeld because he was on seinfeld roll the clip i'll give you five bucks <laughs> all in all i would say saw 2 is I feel like for being so middle of the road, it kind of feels like it was under average. If we have 10 films to go through, I think that I'd have to put it at like a six. It's a little under average, which I would assume five is absolute average. So I, I think that I'm gonna have to put Saw 2 at number six. And honestly, from this one too, it kind of makes me rethink putting Saw 1 immediately at one so early on. You know, I mean, we have eight more films to go through. This one can't be the best, right? It's the first one, sure, but I'm gonna drop it down to three to be safe. I'm gonna hope that there's at least two more of these films films that are interesting. So right now the rankings are Saw 1 at 3 and Saw 2 at 6. <sighs> Sitting here talking about the film after you watch it too just doesn't do the service of we've sat through about four and a half hours of Saw movies already. It's daunting. This is a daunting task. Hearing people scream from torture devices, it's only so, it's it's never really fun. Honestly, I was gonna say it's only some for fun. Sir. It's only fun for so long, but really it's, I, 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 I'm not sure. But on to the next one. Next up, we have Saw 3. Now, Saw 3 comes in. It's directed by Darren Lynn Bozeman. I'm pretty sure he is the guy who just directs him for a long time. But they come back now, and they get a $10 million budget. And this movie rakes in a whopping 1648 dollars million bones. Pretty good. Damn good. By this time too, James Wan's setting up his other, he, I'm pretty sure he's an executive producer on these, making bank. And then next year he's going to drop Insidious, which also costs like $5 and makes like a hundred plus million dollars. God damn it, James Wan. Give me money. I just want a loan. Just a charitable loan. But the plot to this movie is this. Jeff, a man grieving the loss of his child, is put through a series of tests to forgive those he blames for the tragedy. Concurrently, Jigsaw, now on his deathbed, has his apprentice Amanda kidnap Dr. Lin to keep him alive. Now this movie, in my opinion, has, a, I mean, it's a very strong story. I like this. We get to see Jigsaw, he has his cancer. The B story to this is him being kept alive. We do have some detective stuff, but really, not really. It's lighter on the detective stuff this time, which is nice because honestly, the detective stuff gets pretty fucking cringe, all right? It's kind of fucking boring. I don't care about cops. I hate the whole like rigmarole of having to go to the police station. Like, oh, we got evidence in the back, blah, blah, blah. I just, I don't know. I say leave it out. Leave it the hell out. It immediately starts off at the end of the second movie, which we kind of start seeing a theme happen as well, which it starts off with Donnie Wahlberg, which I mean, has it has to be the last movie that he was ever in. I can't remember the last movie. If Donnie Wahlberg's been a movie since 2007, just put him up here. I hope it's just crickets or something like that. <laughs> but essentially, Donnie Wahlberg, who was trapped in the last movie, crushes his leg out and he starts trying to get out. Who knows what happens to him? Who the fuck knows? He just kind of is like, oh, and starts crawling out. This is where the movie, the Saw movies, hit a peak with the torture devices, with how they show them, and how gruesome and kind of like fun and creative they are. Our traps for this film, for Saw 3, are chains being ripped off. A guy has to rip off chains from his body. Ribs being ripped apart through a, a little machine. It is a machine that rips your ribs up. Shotgun necklace. Really impractical and really funny. It's just extremely extra. A woman being frozen to death. We can't show it because it's bare tits. And as much as I'd love to show it to you, YouTube would slap me on the wrist. Drowning via pig guts pretty fucking gross. And the rack. That's like in the medieval times it was you would get stretched, but this one is it's an industrial rack, so it's like his hands, his feet and his neck are twisted. It's pretty fucking gruesome. Let's get into the movie. Which this movie, it's fun. We get to see Jeff, who is a very sad dad because his son died. Oh, boo hoo. 
Just kidding, that would be pretty tragic. But we see Jeff who is mourning. He, he can't really process the death of his son who was killed by someone hitting him with a car on accident. I don't think it was a drunk driving thing. I think it was just an accident. And he has a daughter who's not neglected, but you can tell he is not, he's the shell of his former self. And it's very sad. And he gets abducted by Jigsaw because Jigsaw is a great guy and he wants there to be orphans. Yeah. And our other main character, the B character of the story, is Dr. Lynn, a boss-ass bitch woman who at the beginning of the movie saves a little boy's life in the ER and then the nurse is immediately like, you need to take that attitude somewhere else, sugar. <laughs> she should've just done the Danny Glover accent. And she's getting scolded. She's not herself. She's very moody. She's a moody bitch. And no one likes her because she's so moody. She's so moody that at the beginning, as she's leaving for work, she's like, what? Her husband's laying in bed. She's like, what? What do you want? And her husband's like, I want a divorce. And she's like, God. And I was like, well, once again, see when even in there, weird industrial room, which maybe th makes you think again that it's supposed to be like the gross, weird, rusty life that you live, right? I don't know. But essentially we do get to see the cop from the last movie, Detective, what's her name? Scroll down, scroll down. Detector, is it, was it? Uh, uh, scroll down, uh, scroll up. Eww. Scroll down just a hair, scroll down. Troy, Detective Troy, whatever. Detective Troy from the last movie, I'm sure you remember her. She sits there and uh, she gets kidnapped this time as well. Which, when they go to investigate the guy who has to rip out the chains from his mouth, you start to see him like, how the fuck is he supposed to get out of that? He's supposed to rip a chain, like a, a big bar, out of the front of his face? The guy does almost everything right. He tears off all the other things and in the last second, he gets his fucking like body exploded by a nail bomb. Kind of crazy. The detectives come in to look at it and one of the detectives is, I, I mean, if I'm being honest, overly sus. I mean, the guy is like extremely, extremely, Extremely suspicious to me. He's just like, he just looks like a fucking scumbag. And Detective Troy is kind of questioning him. Yada, 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 doesn't matter. She gets captured. Uh-oh. She has a big device set in her here. And uh, she gets her ribs ripped out, even though she has to grab a key from a jar of acid, which she does it, but there's no lock. And then she sees somebody step out. We don't know who it is. And boom, her chest gets ripped out. It looks fucking awesome. Really fun. We cut back to Jigsaw, which Amanda from the second movie, the meth head chick, she wheels her in, the doctor to Jigsaw, who's just like, Oh, you're gonna have to operate on my brain because I'm dying. Keep me alive, or here's the shotgun necklace, you're gonna fucking die. Immediately also, before we get into that, how does Jigsaw afford all this? These giant industrial empty spaces. I don't know if you've ever looked up commercial spaces to rent. It's like $70,000 a month for that size. Just saying, kind of impractical, okay? I don't know. Whatever, doesn't matter. But essentially that starts us off. Jeff gets to walk around his big sad sap and every one of his trials are people who are somehow involved in the death of his son. Which the first woman we can't show, because like I said, her tatas are hanging out, but she's shivering in this cooler and every second that he doesn't go and try to get grab this key ring, the back of these frozen pipes, she gets sprayed with water, it's very painful and she freezes. We learn that she was a bystander who watched this child get hit by a car and she just drove away. So I was like, that's pretty fucked up. At the same time, do I I think she deserves to get hung up and frozen to death? I wouldn't think so. Which Jigsaw has a line in this movie that I thought was just super cringe. He's just like, I don't condone murder and I despise murder. It's just like, is the movie trying to justify to me that you're not a murderer? Because that's a murder. You're putting someone in a situation where they can die and it's up to them to do it. I understand it's very uh, light. Ka kami, kamigami. Whatever, Death Note. Light Kamigami. What the fuck's his name? Whatever, put it here. That light. This one right here. With the Death Note where it's like he gets to decide if you kind of live or die and it's up to the actions you have. I don't know. It's just like some weird incel cringe try hard shit. It's just a little speed bump. I was just like, oh God. But essentially, uh, in all of these challenges, Jeff ends up helping them, but it takes a second for him to like wrap his brain around not being like vindictive towards these people. Which to me, whenever, it's a pretty funny cut. I wonder if we could play it with her frozen because I don't know if you can see her tits there, but. She's just an icicle. He sees her for one second, turns around, she's a full blown popsicle, dude. It's pretty fun. Which the next one that Jeff goes and sees, it's the judge that gave the guy who hit his son with a car, like was it like three months of probation or something? Like a very small sentence for killing a child. Even accidentally, it felt kind of like, really? That feels very like you're undermining the child's death. Which his torture is pretty awesome. He's like clamped down at the bottom of a vat. I was dipped in a vat. <laughs> 
pigs are being shredded and he's being drowned in their own blood, which let me tell you, I am claustrophobic as shit. And the idea of like being clamped down and unable to move, that was enough for me to freak out. But the interesting thing Jeff has to do this time is he has to burn all of his son's possessions, which once again, I found funny because it's like, who had the time to go and collect those things and put them in an incinerator? I don't know. It's kind of funny. But once again, Jeff's freaking out, and this time he does do it, and he does end up saving the judge and helping this guy out. Until finally he goes into the next room where he has to take a bullet for the guy who was the man behind the wheel, who nailed down his son, who is now on the rack getting his bones twisted. I mean, he's been wanting to fucking scream and murder this guy forever, but still, once again, he does it. He grabs the shotgun, the key on the shotgun, which if you pull the key, it's gonna shoot no matter what. And like a dumbass, the judge is standing there, gets blasted in the side of his face. That's not Jeff's fault. What a fucking dipshit. But he doesn't do it in time. And uh, the guy, his bones twist. It's very gruesome. It's fucking, it's actually very, very cool. That essentially leads Jeff to enter into the ending of the story. And, you know, we have some stuff with Dr. Lynn. She's kind of getting, not smootsy, but her and Jigsaw are, have been talking. You know, she's just saying, hey. And Amanda's getting jealous. You can guys see her seething the whole time. There's a part in the movie where she is about to bang some heroin, but instead she does a healthy thing by cutting her thighs. That's it. If you ever have a drug addiction, just take up cutting way better. And essentially the end of the movie is if Jigsaw dies, then Dr. Lin dies because the shotgun necklace is attached to his heartbeat, yada, yada, yada. End of the movie is Amanda shoots Dr. Lin. Uh-oh, she's bleeding on the floor, but you don't, you get the biggest twist of all that Jeff was her husband. Dr. Lin and Jeff were married. She's been cheating on Jeff. And uh, the person at the beginning who said, I want to divorce, it's really her fuck buddy who wants her to divorce Jeff, the sad dad. And she's all guilt up too because her son died. So Jeff sees his wife get shot. He shoots Amanda. Uh-oh, she's dying. While Jigsaw's on his deathbed, he's just like, oh, by the way, Amanda, this was your fucking test, all of this stuff. And guess what? You failed, bitch, because you were supposed to be my heir. <laughs> mic drop. Big twist. Big, big twist. Jeff, in his fit of rage, grabs the chainsaw. He tries helping everybody, but he sees that this is the guy who put him in here, and uh, he slices his throat open. He plays a cassette tape, just being like, well, you fucked up, buddy. And uh, Jigsaw dies. His wife dies. Big explosion of the head. Pretty funny. And he's locked in a room to die forever. That's where the movie ends. Big boom. Honestly, all in all, it was the most enjoyable one so far, but I can tell you that three movies in, I, like, I'm, this should be done. There should not be any more of these. It's a fun ending to it. Even even Jigsaw's heir loses this this treatment that he does this rehabilitation through these trials aren't actually working he is a flawed man himself he thinks that he knows everything but he doesn't it's a fun ending but it doesn't end there we're only on the third movie out of ten saw three I kind of want to put it at three it made me appreciate the first one a little bit more with the first one's subtlety but the third one is leagues better than six so I think that I'm gonna have to go saw one I'm gonna put it at two you never know there might be some home run coming up I don't know. And we'll put Saw 3 at 3. So 2, 3, 6. Not bad. Honestly, for the third one, too, I expected it to be way worse. I thought that it was going to be like, I don't know, 9 or 10. You know, usually the third movie is always kind of, eh, suck. So on to the next one, I guess. Okay, Saw 4 time. The fourth installment, once again, directed by Darren Lynn Bozeman. Budget of 10 million. They made about the same amount as the second, or the third movie as well, 140 million. People just keep coming back. Keep coming back to see these. What's the plot? As the FBI gets closer to catching Jigsaw, another game is set into motion. The film delves deeper into Jigsaw's backstory and his transformation into the infamous killer. So this movie, let me tell you something. When I was watching this movie, I got so fucking frustrated because I saw the twist almost immediately. We'll get into it, but let me just go down the list of the traps we have, which is see no evil, speak no evil, two men are chained up, one of them's eyes are sewn shut and the other one's mouth is sewn shut and they are being pulled into like a motor that's gonna crush them. We get an ice trap, Donnie Wahlberg, he's in the movie again, don't worry, he's still cashing checks, basically getting strangled and if a block of ice melts, he'll get strangled. We get like a kind of a grape dungeon, as it were, where a guy gets his eyes poked out for doing grape. I thought he should get his dick cut off or something. His limbs get ripped off too, but essentially he has to press in and stab his eyes out. Knives in the face, ice block to the face. What do those mean? I don't know. We'll find out. This movie starts off with Jigsaw in the autopsy room. And let me tell you, I was actually very, I was electrified by this point of the movie because immediately the movie starts off and you get to see Tobin Bell's dick and balls. Jigsaw's dick and balls. 
Very, very nice. At his age too, I was just like, dude, good for you, man. Show your old ass cock and balls, hell yeah. And essentially they're in the autopsy room, the guy cuts him up, and in his stomach is like a piece of wax. And then Detective Hoffman, who was in the third movie, the very suspicious guy, he opens it up and it's a cassette tape of him being like, you think the game's over? It's just begun. And you're like, oh God, here we go, dude. They're like, we don't plan on ending these fucking movies for a long time, dude, for real. This movie begins with Officer Rick, who is the same black guy. He was like the SWAT guy from the first three movies. I'm pretty sure he's in all three of the first movies. And motherfucker's upset that all of his friends keep dying. Everybody he's known on the force is completely dead. He goes to look up Detective Troy's body, who whenever you go there, her ribs are all open and they put a rat in there. I was like, oh my God, dude, this is so fucking cheesy. I remember I just looked at the screen and I just yelled, boo. Boo! At the screen, all right? But the whole thing immediately that I saw was I was like, the FBI comes in and they're like, oh, Jigsaw needs another killer because how would an, a chemo-ridden cancer patient, how would he lift that up? How would they lift that man up? She's a hundred and whatever pounds, he's only X pounds. And then they're like, well, there's probably somebody helping him. And Officer Hoffman's like, are you sure? I mean, it was probably Jigsaw. And I'm like, Hoffman is the guy. Hoffman is in on it. I mean, almost immediately. And guess what, newsflash, yeah, yes he is. Which he gets captured later, he's doing the whole rigmarole, but dude, we've seen the main guy say that he's dead or captured already, so it's not fucking new. I'm like, okay, you're tied up to a chair, you're just gonna untie yourself at the end, okay? But we get to see Donnie Wahlberg still here. He's a bearded Donnie Wahlberg this time to show that he's been captured for a while. And he's on a blocks of ice, he's doing a little tiptoe because if the ice block melts and Officer Rick can't complete the challenge in time, the ice block, will melt and strangle him. And then we have a new guy who's presumed to be the new uh. Jigsaw, which I was like, it's Saw 1 all over again with the guy who is capturing and orchestrating the plan isn't really the guy in charge. He's the guy who's also being put through a test or something. He just, you can see it from a mile away. And essentially this time, Rick is the A story as we follow Rick going through and his whole thing with, from Jigsaw is don't interfere. Stop trying to save everyone. That's his motto. And what do they do? He tries to save everybody. He has to go through and do these intricate clues and stuff. And then we get introduced to the F FBI agents who are just like, you're not doing your job right. And this FBI guy goes to crime scenes for maybe 30 seconds and fucking solves the mystery every time and leaves. I'm just like, I don't know. We get tons of flashbacks in this movie of Jigsaw's backstory with him and his wife and his wife, his, her child died because a crackhead hit a door, but she owns, or his wife owns a rehab or clinic and one night when she's closing up, a meth head breaks in, hits her stomach and kills her and Jigsaw's baby. And that's kind of any yeah, other kid's name was supposed to be Gideon. And that's like what propels him to start his first trap, which is the meth guy has to push his face through a series of blades and then he dies. What I don't like about this already is one, too many characters. I mean, like already, I feel like I've, I'm exhausted just talking about this. We have Rick and all of the people that he's trying to interfere with and help save. We have all of his victims, which is like a grapist, this fat grapist who has a lot of like disgusting videos. I'm not gonna show any of it because we'll get demonetized. Him, the crack whore, Rick's wife, Rick. Detective Hoffman, the two FBI people, old white man, young African-American woman, I think, or, right? Whatever. Young woman, Jigsaw's wife in the past, past Jigsaw. It's just too many storylines to comprehend. And then also the biggest and most egregious crime of this movie, in my opinion, is taking out all of the crazy allure to what Jigsaw's character is, which is just like a guy who got dealt a shitty hand and now he's a psychopath and he's like making these crazy fucking machines and you don't have to like explain how he can. He just simply can. But in this movie, it's like, oh, he's an architect. Oh, he's a loving guy. Ah, life poo-pooed on him. And you find out also that, which I think you find this out in the third movie, I forgot to say that Jigsaw's trial was him driving his car into like a tree or off a cliff and he survived. And he's like, that's how, that was my test. And it's like, okay. I don't think that compares to getting your fucking face ripped open by a bear trap headset, dude, but let's justify that. But then even going back and forth with how these scenes are edited together, I mean, you get all those crazy classic Saul edits but it's just over the top. I mean, the, the editing is just fucking abysmal. Not only to all of the super spiral, crazy ah! flash bang edits, but also there's one where a guy throws a body through a mirror and then it transitions into a new scene and you just immediately think, go fuck yourself. It's just fucking abysmal. They had the one cool transition from three where you're like, oh, that was kind of cool. And now they tried redoing it with the mirror smash in this scene. And they did it three times, like overdoing it because they probably saw people being like, that one transition was cool and now they did it three fucking times and it is 
it's so daunting. The editing is just repulsive. It wraps up so quickly, and the whole idea is that at the end, really, Donnie Wahlberg and Detective Hoffman, who's definitely the other guy, Rick is not supposed to open the door until the time runs out. So as they're going out, Donnie has a gun, and he shoots Rick walking through the door. Rick's bleeding out. He shoots the guy who was the lawyer to, like, a CD shitty principal earlier on. Donnie's head does get smashed by two giant ice cubes. And that's probably the highlight. That's probably the only good part of this film is just the head smash. That was fucking sweet. But then Detective Hoffman gets up and he says, game over and shuts the door to leave that guy to bleed out. Game over. And then it's like, this is the fourth time I've heard game over. I'm going to fucking kill myself, honestly. And then it cuts back to the beginning of the movie where Hoffman's sitting there and it's Jigsaw's tape to him. And he's the new Jigsaw guy or he's one of his disciples. I fucking hated this movie. Okay. There's really no other thing I can say that it's just, this movie sucked. I mean, it's so fucking boring. Every death is watered down. It's nowhere near as fun or gruesome as even the second, like, not even the second movie, but nowhere near as close and cool to even the third movie. God, it's just so convoluted. Way too many characters. Them trying to introduce like the M. Night Shyamalan twist into every single thing. But now how they're trying to go above and beyond is now they're trying to add multiple twists into the movie. And it's just a convoluted mess, dude. It's obnoxious. And I, by this point too, I got, I got upset, but I was like, there's six more. We have not even hit the fucking halfway mark. And this, this is dog shit, which I mean, I'm just going to put, I mean, 10. I'm not even going to get up and explain anything. 10. This is all probably still the same, but that right now it's absolutely 10. I mean, which also by this point, it's like, I don't really know how else the story can move forward because Jigsaw is dead. He's the guy who is the industrial engineer that are making these things. So essentially all of those traps should be dead and he's still having voice recordings. So he's like, he's the chess master. I get that. He's always like 12 moves ahead or whatever, but how do you keep milking this? Especially by this point, Tobin Bell probably can't be in it anymore. And that's the, vo I mean, he is holding this franchise up carrying it all on his back so i don't look forward to the fifth one at all at the end of the movie the fbi detective who is able to solve all these fucking things in like 30 seconds he's monk you guys remember the movie the show monk gets to go and or house whatever any of these stupid fucking shows but in this movie he's in the room and shoots jeff which we don't see in the third movie so they just kind of add that and then hoffman shuts the door locking him in so it's like they're setting up sequel bait to see it's going to happen in the next one but it's just that you're just adding and you're changing shit from the previous movies to fit these stupid convoluted fucking narratives i still have six more movies to go hopefully five is better right it can't get much worse than this Saw 5! Saw 5 came out in 2008, had a 10.8 billion, million, uh million. Had a $10.8 million budget. It grossed $113.9 million. Still an insane profit, but we're starting to dip down. I think people are starting to get, there's a little franchise fatigue starting to happen. Once again, though, still extremely popular. There's no way in hell they're going to stop pushing these babies out. So let's get into it. Which the movie does start off very strong with the trap is a guy has to press his hands into these little devices and crush his hands or a pendulum is going to come down and cut him in half, which he does do it successfully in time, even though he crushes his hands, but the key doesn't work because Hoffman's behind it and he does doesn't really want anybody to survive. He's an actual murderer and the guy gets cut in half. It's fun. It's a nice pendulum. I like a nice pendulum death, dude. Who doesn't like all that kind of stuff? It's fun. That's the only good part. Okay, this movie, uh, oh my God. What we found so far is that in Saw 4, it's kind of a remake of Saw 1, and now Saw 5 is a remake of Saw 2, which in this one, it's like, oh, it's a group again. You're supposed to work together. It is the most monotonous, boring, convoluted traps ever. I mean, I'll, the majority of them are them break glass to find a key. Am I, hello? We get one of the worst line reads at time code 2516 in the movie. Play it right here. Hey man, she's asking you a question. How do you know her? How do you know her? Answer me! I am a surgeon! My God, it's fucking, it's it's terrible. We're following uh, FBI agent Rick this time because he knows Hoffman's in on it. So it's about him trying to find Hoffman the whole time and Hoffman trying to evade everything. Yada, yada, yada. Who gives a shit? It starts off with Detective Rick. He gets caught this time from the... No, he's already. Well... Hello? He gets caught in the room by Hoffman and his head's put into this thing where water's gonna rush in, which is just like, if Hoffman isn't even gonna let anybody live, why doesn't he just shoot them in the head? I mean, immediately my thought, number one. But instead you get him starting to drown, but he does give himself a trach uh, tracheonectomy. 
tracheotomy. He stabs a pin in his fucking throat and he's able to breathe, which makes sense because he was the monk character for the last one. So he should be smart and know that he has all these, you know, he's able to survive. And honestly, he's the most likable character I've seen in like all the other movies. Yeah, he's a pompous dickhead, but at least it's like he's competent and he actually like makes sense as a character. He's a smart detective, yada, yada, yada. And he knows that Hoffman's the guy who did it. And now this whole movie is about Hoffman trying to evade the law or people finding out that he's Jigsaw, even though it's obvious. I mean, really, there's not much to even say with this film. I mean, Saw 5, all of the traps are bad. Every single one of them, besides the pendulum, it's like they all suck. I mean, there's like a bathtub one where they have to like shock themselves. I mean, the only other thing that's like gruesome is they have to, once again, because it's a team thing, they're all supposed to fill out a certain amount of blood by cutting themselves, their hands on these table saws, which is a, it is brutal, but at the same time, it's like, it's just watching people with their face pressed up glass screaming as prosthetic arms get cut and the guy pulls his hand out and it's all like, oof. Like, it's like split down the middle and it's really stupid. And essentially in this one, Rick, who's chasing him, he should have once again just stayed put, which is exactly the same thing that Donnie Wahlberg was supposed to do in the second movie. But because he went and searched, he gets trapped in one of the Star Wars wall closing trash compactor things, which how do they build that? Also, Detective Hoffman gets into a glass sarcophagus and sinks into the floor. Who has time to build all this? Is the main antagonist not a cancer patient? Isn't he dying? Who the fuck is making all of this? It's too eccentric. It's too too fucking stupid. Honestly, it makes Saw 4 seem redeemable in its story and its traps and everything. This movie is just a slog. There's really nothing else to say about this movie. I don't care about any of the characters. All the original cast is dead. We're left with Detective Hoffman, who is not a good antagonist. He's just like, he looks just sweaty and he's just a pompous asshole, but it's not fun pompous. It's just like, God, get him off the fucking screen, dude. His puckered lips. Ah whatever. And then the guy gets crushed at the end and it's just like, they pour like maybe a coffee cup of blood on the coffin. I'm like, I'm pretty sure this would be like an obscene amount of blood and guts falling, but it's just him doing at the end of the film. I fucking hated this movie. This was an actual slog, dude. Unbelievably brutal. I mean, I gotta move four to nine and I'm putting five at the bottom. I thought it couldn't get worse. It gets worse. I mean, I'll move Saul one to one. I'm gonna move Saul two to five. Yeah. I'm still gonna remain optimistic. I'm gonna hope that number two can be filled up. But so far, the, the, it's moving forward. If anything, this trajectory is gonna be, I'm hoping that all of these aren't just, oh, every new movie is going to be last. I don't know. I have nothing else left to give. I simply, I have nothing more to give. So, on the Saw 6. Now, Saw 6. Saw 6 comes in, it's directed by Kevin Grudert, and this movie was made for $11 million, a little more budget, but this time, once again, franchise fatigue sets in, $68.2 million. Once again, it's a it's a healthy profit, but we're not even getting into the hundreds anymore. You can tell that the audience is kind of losing interest in the story, but what's the plot? The focus is on the insurance executive who denied Jigsaw's cancer treatment claim. He's forced to make decisions about who lives and who dies, mirroring the choices he made in his own profession. So this movie is all about, it's pretty much a giant commentary on the healthcare system. This time, Jigsaw still kind of involved because it's all about the people who denied him treatment because he wanted to go to Norway for some kind of specialty treatment, but his healthcare wouldn't provide him. So he was kind of, you know, pissed off. And this is him being like, well, if, if you get to choose who lives or dies, you get to do that here. So it's basically the healthcare CEO getting to go through all of the mazes and he gets to decide which person lives and which person dies. It's a very kind of self-choice. But then now it just becomes literal murder where before, once again, John was supposed to be like a martyr, but now it's just like, well, one person's gonna die, but it's still not my fault, it's the CEO. He's the one who strung him up in this machine. So it's like, God, shut the fuck up. Hoffman, once again, just the worst antagonist of all time. His whole thing is him trying to just still, once again, prove that he's not the Jigsaw killer. Rick's partner is back, even though she's gotten shrapnel on her face from the last movie. Play that clip again here. <laughs> Kind of funny. And it's just him trying to basically prove that he's not the Jigsaw killer. Which, just to get Hoffman's stuff out of the way, Jill, Jigsaw's wife, was given a box in the fifth movie, which is like his last wishes, so she's like, has to do some stuff for him. She captures Hoffman and puts like one of the bear traps on him, and it's supposed to be like, oh, this is his thing, but he's unable to do it, but he breaks his hand with the mask, and before it explodes, he's able to put it in a metal grate in a window, and it stops. Before it unlashes, he just jokers his face and cuts his face open. That's all that happens with Hoffman in this movie. Otherwise than that, it's just the CEO getting to go through and do some of the uh, disgusting traps, but let's do some of the traps now. Pounds of flesh, basically two people have to cut off pieces of their skin or limbs and whoever has the most weight of body parts doesn't die. Limbs explosions. The CEO has basically bombs on his limbs and if he doesn't complete the task, they'll explode. 
Which that part actually does have something funny because uh, when Jigsaw, the little puppet's talking to him, and he does a little turn every time. He does the same turn every time. And he's like, let me demonstrate. And there's just like a tiny dummy and it just says, <laughs> it's so lackluster. And it's also like, dude, I think I have enough imagination to know what an explosion on my wrist is gonna be. Like, it's gonna, ex like, yes, I get it. This is going to explode. Just kind of funny. Barbed wire strangulation. Pretty cool. Boiler room. <laughs> Boiler room. Basically steam, hot steam. And then she ends up, you know, she tries to kill the CEO, but he kills her instead. Shotgun carousel. That was probably the strongest one. The CEO has to inflict pain on himself. If he doesn't, the shotgun will shoot the person and they're all on this little carousel. So there it is. And acid injection with son and wife versus the journalist, pretty fun. The one that pisses me off with that one though is that it's completely coincidental that the CEO would be standing right where the device is at to get hit and he just gets injected with a bunch of poison and he dies, so it's whatever. Really, I mean, this whole movie, like I said, it starts off the CEO of this healthcare system, rejects John's claim, he gets his big comeuppance when he has to go through his wife and son get kidnapped and all that stuff and it turns out that it's not really his kids, it's like the family of one of the guys that he rejected, which is why they say, you know, the kid says like a cringy line where he's like, you killed my dad, motherfucker. And he hits the switch and kills him at the end. You killed my father, you motherfucker! Now you burn in hell. Really, all in all, I mean, like the story, I mean, God, it feels like weird. I mean, it's just the same thing. One thing I will say about six, the positives, some of the positives, better traps than five. Probably a more enjoyable watch than five. I mean, there's less crazy early 2000 edits. I think that that kind of started to die down, so they stopped doing that. But also, there's the least amount of time of Hoffman. So it's like, that within itself makes it a better movie than five. Do I think it's better than four? Probably. It has just more. It's them taking a step back in the right direction, but the story is still convoluted. We still have John Kramer in the movie somehow when it's like, dude, you've been dead. Like move away from him. Move the fuck away from this guy and his plights. And now you have like his ex-wife getting involved. Game over. No! Which the problem now too is that the appeal of the first movie is the mystery, getting to unsolve things, which, you know, I mean, to think of new mysteries every time would be difficult, especially for a franchise that's trying to pump these out once a year. But now it's just like, it's not even a mystery, it's just flashbacks. If you've seen any of the Saw movies, you've seen them 12 times because of the amount of flashbacks that they put in the fucking movies, dude. These movies are not even gonna lie, 10 to 15% of the movie is going to be flashbacks. I would say that about four, five, and six, but it's six especially. It doesn't leave any mystery, it doesn't leave any entry, it just spoon feeds you all of this convoluted, which I keep saying, and this, this needs to be the fucking title of this video, the most convoluted franchise of all fucking time. It's just the most watered down, boring, convoluted story that's just being hand fed to you until you're just like shaking your head, just waiting for someone else to just scream so you can be re-alerted again. <laughs> Oh. Bam, scream, death. Flashback, John's a good guy actually. He's crazy, but he's kind of kooky. Hoffman's bad. Bam, someone dies, scream, and end. It's just, it's so tired by this point. It doesn't mean that the franchise or the idea is bad. It's just, they're so uninspired. I think that there's ways that you can still do this and there's like little goldfish nuggets, you know, little fish food nuggets of good ideas, but it's so formulaic. It's so safe that they're just cashing in paychecks by this point. Literally nothing I can say in these last three movies have been almost borderline substanceless. I wouldn't put it at 10. I'd probably, it's gotta be better than Saw 5 and Saw 4 just for the fact that Hoffman, you barely see Hoffman. I'm putting it at eight. Saw 6 at eight feels fair to me. You know what, even, The more I think about it too, it makes me think how kind of lackluster Saw 2 was again also. Just because we're on six, we still have four movies to go. And some of these later ones, I mean, if the trajectory of these movies keeps going worse and by the next one's supposed to be the end of the initial run, I'm gonna put Saw 6 at seven. And I think I'm gonna move Saw 2 back down to six. And I think to be safe too, I think to be safe, I'm gonna move Saw 3 back down to 4. After the series has had some time to simmer off from the initial run from 2004 to 2010, there's a seven year break between those and I'm hoping that maybe some of the newer films will fill the upper slots. But for now, I think that this is the, this feels correct to me. So now finally we get to move to the last, the final chapter, Saw 3D. Oh God. I have a sneaking suspicion Saw 3D is gonna be number 10. The 3D craze in the early 2000s was just atrocious. And for them to end the franchise or supposedly end the franchise on a 3D movie, God help us all. <laughs> okay. 
Jigsaw 3D or Jigsaw 7. Why would you go into your last film, the final chapter of what you think is going to be the last film and call it Saw 3D? The early 2000s was a fucking atrocious time with Final Destination 3D. There's like My Bloody Valentine 3D. They did like a Friday the 13th 3D thing. It doesn't matter. Tons of horror movies doing 3D stuff just because the technology was out. I mean, even like it was the same time as Jackass 3D. We start off this movie and because they're using 3D cameras, the whole movie looks like a CSI episode or like a soap opera. The quality is terrible. The blood doesn't even look like blood. It looks like watered down red paint. It's just awful. Directed by Kevin Groot. Groot. Grootert had a budget of 20 million, their most expensive one yet, but they climbed their way back from the fans by being the last one as they send this one off with $161 million in the box office. Here's the plot. Uh. Jigsaw's legacy continues as survivors of his game seek support. Meanwhile, a self-help guru who has profited from his supposed survival of a jigsaw trap finds himself in a real game. So this concept to the movie is actually fucking awesome. I mean, like, the idea that somebody has faked that they're a jigsaw survivor is a great idea because it, it, it sets up all these things of jigsaw saw being able to go out, which he does, and capture the guy and be like, well, if you want to fucking see how these games really work, bitch, then let's do it. And that's what happens. It's a lot of fun. Granted, this movie brings us back into the light with some better deaths, but this time, the movie feels very schlocky. It feels funny, but not intentionally funny. Because a lot of these deaths, you can tell that they're trying, but they're just very funny. One of the biggest things is that we hold on way too many mannequins. Like, Jill is back, and she's getting attacked by uh, Mark Hoffman in her dream, and you see her big titties with her hard nipples and then we see as as this like device is plowing into her they hold on this terrible mannequin of her and the thing rips through her and the her shirt rips off and you see one of her giant tits fall off of it but it's just like mannequins only work if you use it for like a f i mean a fraction of a second that's the only time this time though we see it all the time the neo-nazi scene that's where like a big selling point for this was chester bennington from lincoln park is one of like the neo-nazis and he's like super glued to the back of a chair which he's like trying to like rip his skin off but whenever you see the skin ripping there's no blood underneath it you just see his actual skin so it's just the latex peeling it just looks so bad the car drops down on like a very obvious mannequin's face like every person that gets a effect in that scene the mannequins are held too long which it makes it so cheap but honestly there was a lot of laughs like I we were laughing a lot while watching this so take that as you will the sixth movie ends with Jill setting up Mark Hoffman to get killed which obviously we see that he doesn't at the end so now it's Mark Hoffman seeking Jill who resides to another cop at this precinct and they're the most incompetent cops ever they're trying to keep him over to a safe house this is by far the most unbelievable of all the cops like I would never in a million years believe this actor to be a Cop. What makes you think you can't find me here? Jill, it's a safe house. Safe house. Safe house. You get it? He's very tiny and nasally. I don't know. It's just I was not buying him at all. Essentially, the whole time is Jill's in a safe house until inevitably she gets captured by Mark, who kicks her in the stomach, starts saying some stuff like, you know, talking about her big, beautiful titties the whole time. I personally thought that was offensive. I didn't like that part. That wasn't in the movie. I wish it was. It would have been funny. And uh, he puts a trap on Jigsaw's wife and kills her. Pretty funny. One of Jigsaw's contraptions killed her, which I think they're trying to do something where it's just like the thing that he made was his wife's demise, even though he wanted nothing but her safety. But it's like, the, the dude's a monster. They're trying to set Jigsaw up as this like fallen angel. And it just, it doesn't work. Like maybe if you're really fucking stupid, you could see like, well, dude, I can see how that would be helpful. Which in this movie, even it's six movies too late. You see some of the survivors in the way that our main protagonist slash antagonist named Bobby, he comes across this idea to fake the story is because he's in a bar watching one of the one of these survivors and they're like actually it helped me i'm thankful that he did it and it's like dude way too late way too late in the franchise to start introducing that bullshit like maybe if you did that in the second movie that would have been very interesting honestly to see people where it's like weird stockholm syndrome kind of like survivors come out and they're just like i love jigsaw and they're like fucking arms are falling off or they're like bleeding out from their stomach really good idea but six movies too late way way too late the whole movie is centered around bobby is talking to a survival group or like a self-help group for other people who have actually been in jigsaw traps which the movie begins with lawrence dr lawrence from the first movie when he hobbles away he's like i'll be back i promise he talks to adam the same way that leonardo dicaprio talks to kate winslet in titanic he's like you're gonna we're gonna have kids he's all freezing that's how uh, lawrence talks to adam at the end of that movie pretty funny we get to see him cauterize his leg and he uh, is now hobbling in this group and he knows that Bobby definitely didn't survive and he's like kind of, you can tell he's been through some stuff because this is what his voice sounds like now. How 
grateful we are to be part of your promotional DVD. He's like, really? So you did survive? How brave of you to let us all in your program. And I'm like, he's definitely in on the jigsaw stuff now. 100%. And this is probably th like four minutes into the movie. Immediately called that out. This movie is just filled with a bunch of really, really fun, really bad line reads. Let's play some of them here. What do we got here? That's Jill Tuck, Jigsaw's widow. What does she want? All she said was that she didn't trust the FBI. Uh-huh. And she didn't trust Homicide. And she just wants to talk to you. Why me? I don't know. Only you, though. Just a little handful, you know, it's nice. But also at least he gets us back. Like Bobby, his whole thing is he's faking that he had to put hooks through his chest and he has like fake scars. And once again, immediately I was like, okay, well he's gonna get captured and have to put those hooks through his scars. The movie is all centered around Bobby having to save all of the people that helped him perpetrate this lie and profit off of it. So that's kind of fun, which also it makes it feel like all of the scumbags that he's friends with, because all of these people are just evil people that are, know about this thing, except his wife. I guess. So whenever they get their comeuppance, it feels justified. I mean, like one of the first ones, a pretty fucking brutal one is he has to remove a fish hook out of his agent's throat. And I mean, he is tugging on that thing hard and it's pretty fucking gruesome. It's really well done. But what's funny is she still dies by getting all these like rods shoved in her neck and he like scolds her about it. He's like, all you gotta do is shut the fuck up, bitch. Why would you just shut the fuck up? And it's like, I don't think I could possibly stay quiet if someone was removing a fish hook from my throat but I digress. Other stuff is he has to lead his friend who's blind across like this broken floorboard thing. And if he falls off, which he does, he gets hung. And Bobby's just like, oh shit, okay. And he moves on to his next one, which is, oh yeah. That was a pretty sweet one too. I think it's his publicist because he wrote a book. He has to like lift these weights that jab into his sides. And if he drops the weight, her face just gets impaled into these spikes in her mouth and eye sockets. Fucking brutal. But to be fair, when he lifts it up in the movie, it just stabs into him and he's just kind of like, uh. this is my, I was like, I was, I was like, is it painful to you? Does it hurt having these rods get jabbed into the side of you? He's just kind of like, ah, oh, fuck. And he just drops it. He's like, I can't. And he just drops it like that. And then she's like, Bobby! And gets her face completely smashed. It's honestly pretty rad. And also, once again, all these people suck. They're all scumbags. They do a nice job at the beginning of setting them up as just being kind of shitty, parasitic, money hungry people. So this time it feels fun. It feels justifiable. It's it, it, that little difference honestly makes the movies much more enjoyable. Makes them funnier. It's a big thing. Like I mean, Chester Biddington's character and all these other mannequins that they have on the floor are all like neo Nazis. So when you see them get fucking absolutely destroyed, it's like funny. It makes it a very enjoyable experience. But what did I tell you? At the end, Bobby does have to put these hooks into his chest, but he does it with such ease. It's like, you have to be, it's a joke. You have to be joking. He like puts it in, he's like, oh my God. It's like, I can't believe it's not butter. Just being like, oh Jesus. Wow. That was tough. Oh my God. I can't believe that happened. And that's all that, <laughs> that's all the kind of emotion we get from him. And he has to climb his way up, but he snaps off the chain and inevitably his wife gets locked into this fucking Optimus Prime transform machine. Who made that kind of weird burning sarcophagus. I don't know, but she burns alive in this uh, giant contraption. And uh, Bobby is, what happens to Bobby? Essentially, we wait all the way at the end, which once again, not enough time with Hoffman. So the movie's already doing great on that end. He comes in and just makes the building that Bobby's in explode. And as he's walking away, because it's 3D, we have a lot of moments where it's like, oh, it's coming at you. And that's one of those moments where I'm like, dude, you're lucky that, that one of those pieces of shrapnel didn't just fucking rip off your head. Which at the end, there's a group of people in pig masks where all the people that were actually bringing bringing these people together weren't Hoffman. It was Dr. Gordon, who since from the beginning has been working with Jigsaw on making stuff. And he's the guy who surgically put the key in the dude's eye from Saw 4 or whatever, or Saw 3 or whatever the fuck it was. I, they all blend together. And he's been working with Jigsaw too, like Hoffman was in Amanda. Big twist. I like the twist, it's fun. And now he's the guy at the end of this movie who is going to carry on Jigsaw's work and fulfill his wishes. He's a more respectable man who understands the game that he's trying to play and trying to pursue. And these victims understand the importance as well. And Mark Hoffman finally gets his comeuppance and dies. No more Mark Hoffman. Oh God, it, it, it was so, honestly, I felt so liberated. But they end it because now you know that either Lawrence is going to carry on his work or it's just over and he's respecting his dead master's last wish by taking care of Hoffman and everything that is tied to Jigsaw is totally done. It ends the franchise that way. And But to be fair, they do the thing where Mark Hoffman gets, gets his come up and by Gordon puts him in the first movie from the Saw, the Saw movie and he says, game over. And Hoffman screams, game over. No! 
So it's just like, while it is cool, it's just like, dude, can we not go back to this fucking, I get the room's iconic and all that stuff, but do we, can we just fucking, like at that point, I'd rather just Lawrence like hobble over and just beat the shit out of him with a cane until he dies. Like that would be funner to me than seeing this stupid fucking room. Needless to say, the original Saw franchise is over. Putting Saw number seven for me, at least right now, I'm gonna move Saw six down to eight and I'm gonna move this to that. Because at least here, it's really funny, but at least Saw 2, it has, it's it's still a bit more, it has some more of the grit, some more of the seriousness, so I appreciate that. So I'm hoping that our five, three, and two can get filled out in the next three installments after they have a seven year break. This movie came out in 2010 and we don't get another Saw film for seven years until 2017, which leads us to our next movie, Jigsaw. Oh God. I just watched Jigsaw, which if the poster doesn't tell you enough with this cringy, like, I guess Heath Ledger Joker kind of callback. Oh my God. This movie came out in 2017, directed by Michael and Peter Spierg. Uh, $10 million budget, $103 million at the box office. Seven years was long enough for people to be like, I forgot about how bad these are and go back and throw money at it. <laughs> What's the plot about? A decade after Jigsaw's death, a new series of murders bearing his signature start to emerge. Yeah, so the whole movie is basically the police and detectives trying to figure out if it's the works of a copycat or if it's Jigsaw or if Jigsaw is still alive. Let's list some of the traps. The bucket room. People getting decapitated by one of the saws. You see one of the guys lose their head here. Not really. You see one of the guys start to wake up as the other people enter the other room. Chain hangers. People are hung by chains. Oh, another person is killed here. Cycle trap. A man is pulled into a spiral and killed it we're lit probably the dumbest jigsaw trap of all time the cycle one so terrible <laughs> Shotgun keys, a woman shot, acid syringe, leg wire trap, buried alive by grain. <laughs> oh God. We are on the seventh movie. There's still three. We're over halfway, but my God, this is my, my God. The movie is doing the exact same thing that it did seven years ago. They've had seven years to just be like, let's cool it off, let's just come back. And they do the exact same thing. A group gets captured, the entire motive is that they have to work together, they've all had some kind of shady past. The big twist is that the things that we're seeing aren't happening in real time, they're happening from years ago. So by the time that the guy who gets, is supposedly gets his head cut off in the first game actually doesn't because Jigsaw says, oh, it wasn't your fault what happened for your little crime so jigsaw comes in last second and saves him and he becomes his apprentice a princess because he's like a shell-shocked war veteran who works at the morgue and all these bodies are popping up because the guy which once again is so obvious he works at the morgue he can get the bodies so people are like is it a copycat and there's all these crooked cops and stuff but it's like no dude it's just the guy at the morgue and oh my god I mean, you go through, it's just so obvious. I mean, you go through, the guy walks in, the bodies are super old, just how we've seen in the other movies with Adam's body that's just been chilling there. And at the end, you see the guy who's in the morgue. You think that it's like a setup for this, like coincidentally, there's a new hire at the hospital or morgue that's just like a jigsaw fanatic who creates and buys replica of the death traps because she's like a 4 channer. That's just a coincidence. It's not like he's like, I hired her because of that. It's just, she just applied. She just simply applied because that's what's the hospital they stayed at. So the whole movie is that it's supposed to be pinned on her, but then you get the reveal that the guy who's the autopsy morgue dude is actually the evil guy and he has a headset laser, which we get to see earlier on that it's like, what kind of fucking technology is this? Sure, we have crazy, weird industrial gimmicks. At least I could in um, at least a lifetime believe that somebody could build that, I guess. But he just gives like an Iron Man laser and people like cutting off body parts. And at the end, he like shish kebabs a guy with the lasers. And I'm just like, how did you, you're like a shell-shocked veteran, not like a neuro fucking rocket scientist. Like how the fuck did you make this? It doesn't matter. This movie was terrible. Like I I have nothing more to really say besides why after seven years, did you come back with this lackluster piece of shit? Once again, as these movies go on, it feels like they're just trying to make you like Jigsaw more and more, that he's trying to be this misunderstood martyr. It's fucking stupid. It's just so dumb. It just shows how limited the Saw universe is and how they should have ended a long time ago. This is officially number 10. We're just moving everything up fucking one. Saw up to two, there, here, here and fucking here. Jigsaw, fuck you at the bottom. My God, please, let's talk about the next movie. 
Next up is 2021's Spiral, AKA Saul A Nine. Saul Nine, but it's called Spiral from the Book of Saul. Directed by Darren Lynn Bozeman, who's probably, I think he's directed probably almost all of them. He's probably the most veteran director. A budget of 20 million, a box office of 37.4 million. This is the worst performed Saw movie so far. Which honestly, the kids don't want to go to the theaters anymore, do they? Just put it on stream, is that right? The plot, a new iteration of the franchise focusing on Detective Ezekiel Zeke Banks, AKA Chris Rock. Keep my wife's name out your fucking mouth. As he unravels a mystery involving a jigsaw inspired killer targeting corrupt police officers, one of them being Samuel Jackson, his dad. So it's kind of funny, it's a movie about Chris Rock, whose dad is Samuel Jackson, who's a crooked cop. Pretty fun. It's like an even worse take of like mixture of training day and everybody hates Chris. Some of the traps in this, if you if we even have to go through them, they're all terrible. Tongue trap, a man's tongue is ripped off. Really, that's a surprise that that's what that does. Finger trap, a man's fingers are ripped off. Once again, could you, are you is your imagination still with us? Wax trap, hot wax pours onto a woman's face, suffocating her. Glass shard trap, a man is shredded by broken glass. Skin trap, a man's back skin is ripped off. So, you know, Spiral is trying to take the mystery and mystique of Saw 1. I think trying to bring it back to be that kind of like seven gritty true crime thing. The thing about it is that Chris Rock is not like the worst part of this movie. I don't think Chris Rock is a bad actor even. I think he could have pulled this off. I think the script is really bad. makes everything he does look fucking stupid and he always has to have some kind of comedic relief. Me no one, no partner. Because he's like a comedian. So it just undermines all of like the actual world tension that they're trying to build. And the whole thing is about Chris Rock kind of being involved with all these crooked cops and he's trying to be a good cop himself, even though the police force has done him wrong. He's a cool cop. He drives a Mustang or a Charger or a Challenger or whatever the fuck it is. Nobody can just drive a normal cop car. You have to make them look as douchey as possible all the time. The big part of this movie is that his new hire is the Jigsaw killer this time, but the Jigsaw killer, the voice they use sounds like a confused lesbian the entire time. It's like, hello, Detective Six. Kind of sounds like that, confused lesbian. If I ever heard someone saying, ah, my daughter's a confused lesbian, play this. Hello, Detective Banks. I'm here to help reform the Metro Police. That's exactly what I would think that they sound like. Dad, can I use the car to go to the gym? <laughs> The twist is pretty obvious again. The new hire is this kid, or it's like a younger guy who is taking justice on all the corrupt officers who killed his dad when he was younger or like hurt his dad when he was younger. And at the end, Chris Rock has to decide between catching the jigsaw killer or saving his dad. And it's the fucking dumbest trap where when the officers come and open the door, his hands move up and he looks like a giant puppet and uh, guns come out and they're like, he's got a gun. And I'm like, he's strung up by wires. You can see, you can see it. They tried justifying it by blasting floodlights behind him as if like they can't see anything, but you can see all of the giant metal contraptions and like you can see like the blood on his chest and everything. And if you can't see all of that, how would you even notice that he has a gun? I don't know. They blast him away and then Chris Rock is left, which I assume that he gets arrested. The movie ends so abruptly. <laughs> He's like, no! Like you see the jigs, the entire police force is right there in the room with them. And I feel like you've just been like, hey, the guy who's doing this is on the elevator. If you just wanna go downstairs and get him, he's right there. That's not what happens. I don't even want, I mean, do I even have to go over this fucking movie? I mean, like, my God, like, it's just such a convolute, like, it's just so bad. Convolute mess, I keep saying it. The whole movie is saying that, like, oh, Jigsaw never went after cops. And it's like, yeah, he did. He went after cops in almost every single one of these fucking movies. Look about, I mean, Donnie Wahlberg is a fucking cop. He went after him. What about the girl who got her fucking rib cage opened? Oh, like, oh, <laughs> the main cast of characters for the first five movies are FBI agents and cops. So that doesn't make any fucking sense. There's just tons of stupid lines in this movie. Oh, my my God. Probably the dumbest one is there's a machine that you put glass in and it shoots glass shards at this guy and it tears up his the skin on his back, but it's supposed to be the guy who got Chris Rock in trouble, so he has to learn how to forgive. And he does try helping him, but it's just tons of glass shards being shot at him. And if Jigsaw has been dead for over a decade, how do people just know how to make these machines? You can't just justify things with just like, well, something bad happened when he was a kid and he studied. It's like, we have no introduction to that. The reason that it's a problem to me is that it may makes what Jigsaw does look easy and it doesn't make him special anymore because it's just like, oh, well anybody can become an engineer and just learn how to make death machines, duh. <laughs> Come on, you never made a death machine before? Are you serious? Are you pussy? Are you dumb dumb? Are you an idiot? You didn't go to engineering school when your dad got shot by corrupt cops? Okay, that's weird. So I, I mean like literally saw, I mean spiral, I, it's number 10. Once again, we're shifting everything up once more.
I can't fucking figure out any of this bullshit. <sighs> Our new ranking, one, two, three, seven, six, four, five, Jigsaw and Spiral. We just have to pray to God that the saving grace of the newest franchise from this year can be number two. I'm sure it can be number two out of what we've seen so far, right? Right? Last but certainly not least is this year's 2023 Saw X. I can't believe they actually made another. After the spiral incident, I'm surprised that they decided to go back and try to bring back Tobin Bell and all of this shit. Very, very surprised. So this was actually a very intrigued watch. We brought back Kevin Grudert, who's done, I think he did some of the earlier ones. I think he did four and five. I'm pretty sure, I can't remember, I don't know. I think he did some of the ones I thought were kind of... So we'll see. This one had a budget of 13 million, but it grossed a whopping $102 million. Man, people, you, all you have to do is just throw a gadget and just say like, oh, Tobin Bell is gonna be in this and people will come running, baby. People will... Fuck. People will come running, baby. The entire plot of this one is Jigsaw. It's a prequel to even the first movie where Jigsaw is trying to go out of his way as a surviving cancer patient. But essentially he's trying to get some kind of miracle, weird, not FDA trusted regiment that's overseas. And he is trying to solve his cancer after one of his cancer group friends, he sees him out in public randomly and uh, he looks all healthy and he's like, would you, what happened? By this time, Tobin Bill has to be like 95 years old. So he's like, what happened? I'm young still. I'm Tobin Bell from the first movie, actually. So far, I would say the structure of this movie is fine. I mean, the last eight out of the 10 movies, I would say, are playing up that Jigsaw or Tobin Bell's character is supposed to be kind of a hero. And they kind of put him in this light too. This time he is not a monster at all. He's kind of fantasizing about the things he's done. I think that at the beginning of the movie, he has started to do some of the stuff that we've seen, like some of the torture devices. We get like this, this one is such a tease because it's like not even a real kill. It's like him daydreaming about doing it. And you're just like, oh, fuck. Off. And it was cool though. The guy gets his eyeballs popped out. That's pretty fun. Which after I, I completely forgot. Let's list off the uh, tracks in this episode. Eyeball pop. Number one. Scapel hands. Leg amputation or head cut off. Brain surgery or face fry. Radiation hanging break your arm and leg. Blood boarding. <laughs> and gas chamber. So this, you know, it's him doing his test already, but now he's trusting these people and he's taking his money. He doesn't have a lot of money and he's, which is funny he says that because I'm like, how did you, maybe if you didn't spend all this time building death machines, you'd have more money to go do this shit. I digress. But he goes down to South America where the guy, the scientist's daughter is doing the procedures for him because he's been exiled. So now he goes there, he does the treatment. It's a big success, but uh oh, he's been conned. I love this. I wish that this was just the third movie. If this would have been the third movie, then it's like, a perfect prequel because it's like well you don't even know who the fuck you just messed with dude and it's a perfect him getting retribution on all the shitty people that tried fucking him over that were in on this plan which is a lot of fun he does befriend a small mexican child which later comes back with the blood thing <laughs> also a man that comes back <sighs> They needed to fucking ask Scorsese how to de-age some people because that bitch looked old, dude. Like some like serious plastic in her face. Like, which you know, people age whatever, but whenever you're trying to do these prequel things, maybe don't do them 20 years after the first fucking movie, dude. Duh! The whole movie is him basically getting revenge on all these people. He's in control the whole time until a second bystander comes in who is one of the other patients who also wants revenge, but it turns out to be the lady's fuck buddy or that they're in love with each other. So the last trap that was meant for her ends up being Jigsaw and the little Mexican boy. And they find out, they're like, wait, if there's only one person left, who was supposed to be there? And it was supposed to be Jigsaw and Amanda, but Jigsaw saw that coming because he's the chess master. One way or another, it's all gonna work out according to plan. He saw that coming and it was actually meant to be for the boyfriend and the main bitch, the doctor. So now their whole, their actual thing is they grab the money and it sets off the trap, which is like a gas chamber. And now they have to like take turns getting fresh air or whoever's gonna die. And really it's them fighting for survival and they both kill each other. And it ends with a happy ending of Jigsaw walking away with Amanda and the little Mexican boy who we never see again. And then Jigsaw and Amanda end up killing a bunch of people. And it's happy. Right? It's, supposed to be, it's like, we're gonna go back to America and fucking kill everybody. All in all, I will say this was a fun watch. I think that this was a fun watch just because all the other movies, the stories are such a slog. So I think for right now, if I had to move this, all right, let me, let me fuck around with this. I really need to, let me stand up and look at this shit. Before I put this up, I want to do a final look over. Saw one is a great murder mystery. Is it the, but when I think about it, did I really have the most fun with it? I don't know. I don't think Saw two deserves to be three. I know that for a fact. 
Did I enjoy Saw 2 more than I enjoyed Saw 7? I don't think I enjoyed it even. Because looking back on it after watching all of these, I laughed the most with this one. Saw 7 was at least funny bad. So I almost want to switch. I want to put Saw 3 at 2. I want to put 2 at 4. 7 at 3 and 10 at 5, but I don't know. This still doesn't look right. I feel confident actually with 10, 9, 8, and 7 because this, this feels appropriate. 7 being 5, 8 being 4, 9 being Jigsaw and 10. I mean, you could swap between Jigsaw and Spiral, but I think Spiral, it was just like, it's barely a Saw movie, so I think it deserves to be last. I really, <sighs> hmm. I think 10 is better than 2. I think if you moved it like this, this feels a little bit better. Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. I think I'm gonna make a controversial play here. I think Saw 3 is the best one. My justification is this. Saw 3 has everything in essence of what a Saw movie is, which is the main test, a good twist, good kills or tortures, and it has like strong characters that you actually wanna give a fuck about. We have the initial cast of Tobin Bell dying of cancer. We get to see his brain, do all that kind of stuff. We get more invested into Amanda. Is she gonna be the person that takes over? I think that it, it's, this is the quintessential Saw movie, Saw 3. I have to say that. And I think Saw 1, I think that it is, it's gotta at least be number two. I mean, it's the quintessential thing that started the franchise. I'm, I'm actually happy with Saw 7 being at number three. I think it's the dumbest one. I think anything past these two, honestly, gets very stupid and it needs to be kind of schlocky, which is why I think Saw 7 ranks so high because it's the schlockiest and it feels the most on the nose. It does the deaths in a fun way where there's too much mannequins, the blood looks cheap, it's great. I honestly think Saw 10 is the last good story. I think the rest of them, all the stories are terrible. Saw 10 at least has Tobin Bell. It's very consistent with him being like, like a Punisher, kind of like dark vigilante kind of thing. Saw 2 sucked. Saw 6 was worse. Saw 4 was worse. Saw 5 was even worse. Jigsaw was a terrible and Spiral should have never even been brought into existence. So this feels like it's it. My list is done. This took 16 hours. 16 hours and 30 minutes of my life that I'll never get back. That's okay. I'm gonna die soon anyways. But the idea is uh, I don't give a fuck if they ever make a Saw movie again. I'm not watching them. Refuse to watch them. So please don't make any more, even though you're definitely going to because the last one made over $100 million. So please God, spare us. This is it. The beautiful last Saw ranking. Wait, what are you talking about? I, I completed the task. I, I did the ranking. No! 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 My favorite show of all time is Big Mouth. <laughs> my, my favorite show of all time is Big Mouth. It is a show about adolescent teens going into puberty. <laughs>